Good afternoon. I don't have to remind this audience that April is Poetry Month. In fact, uh, we have recently passed the anniversary of the departure of the now renowned group of pilgrims from the Tabard Inn in Suffolk as they set off uh, toward Canterbury in 1387. The Hammer Poetry Series, in whose own journey this event is an adventure, began at UCLA's Sunset Canyon Recreation Center only about 50 years ago, but five decades provides a certain patina of respectability. And today it joins for the first time with another tradition, the prestigious Anthony Hecht Poetry Prize reading. I'm Stephen Yenser from UCLA's English department, one of the sponsors of the poetry series, along with the Hammer Museum's public programs office, headed by the dauntless Claudia Bester. And we are delighted to introduce the distinguished poet Joseph Harrison, who is also the American editor of Waywiser Press, which under its enterprising editor and publisher, Philip Hoy, originated and sustains the Anthony Hecht Poetry Prize. Joe will now tell us the tale of Anthony Hecht and Waywiser. Thank you all for attending this afternoon. And thanks to Claudia Bester and the Hammer Museum for being such helpful and welcoming hosts. And to Steven Yenser for his assistance in arranging to have this event at the Hammer, albeit virtually. The Anthony Heck Poetry Prize, awarded annually for a first or second book of poems in the English, and open to poets from anywhere in the world, was founded in 2005. Every year, the staff at the Wayweiser Press sorts through some 400 manuscripts, choosing 15 to 18 semifinalists, then at a panel meeting, votes to send seven to 10 candidates, stripped of all identifying reference, onto that year's final judge. These are not easy decisions, as we always receive numerous remarkable entries in various styles. Thanks to the quality of our entrants and the perspicacity of our final judges, the Anthony Heck Prize has become one of the most prestigious a poet can win early in his or her career, and has rewarded the tangible achievements of such poets as Maury Creech, Erica Dawson, Carrie Gerald, Jeffrey Brock, and Catherine Hollander. Though he did not, alas, live to see it come into being, the great American poet Anthony Heck endorsed our endeavor. We thought it appropriate to name this prize in his honor, not only because of his supreme mastery of the art, but also because throughout his life, his support for and encouragement of younger poets was exemplary. Since it is hard to believe, almost 17 years since he was among us, we realize that some in the audience may not know what he looked like or have had the unforgettable experience of hearing him read. So what follows, along with two photographs of him, one from the early 70s, the other from 2001, is a passage from his magnificent long poem, The Venetian Vespers, accompanied as illustration of the scene by a painting of Monet's. Lights. I have chosen Venice for its light its lightness, buoyancy, its calm suspension in time and water, its strange quietness. I, an expatriate American living off an annuity, confront the lagoon's waters in mid-morning sun. Palladio's church, 
floats at its anchored peace across from me, and the great church of health, voted in gratitude by the Venetians for heavenly deliverance from the plague, voluted, levels itself on the canal. Further away, the bevels coil and join like spiraled cordon ropes of silk, the lips of the crimped water sped by a light breeze. Morning has tooled the bay with bright inlays of writhing silver, scattered scintillance. These little crests and ripples, promenade, hurried and jocular and never bored, il se promène like families of some means on Sundays in the bois. Observing this easy festivity, hypnotized by tiny sun signals exchanged across the harbour, I am, for the moment, cured of everything. The future held at bay, the past submerged, even the fact that this sea of Hedria, this consecrated, cool wife of the Doge, was ploughed by the merchant men of all the world, and all the silicate fragility they sweat for at the furnaces now seems an admirable and shatterable triumph. One reason why the Anthony Heck Poetry Prize has proved to be so successful has to do with the standing of the judges we appoint. The very first prize, launched back in 2005, was judged for us by the late J.D. McClatchy, Anthony Heck's literary executor, and a wonderful poet, editor, essayist, and educator. Since then, a veritable who's who of poets have agreed to take on the role. Mary Jo Salter, Richard Wilbur, Alan Shapiro, Rosanna Warren, James Fenton, Mark Strand, Charles Simic, Heather McHugh, Anthony Thwaite, Evan Boland, Gertrude Schnackenberg, Andrew Motion, and Charles Wright. Thanks to them and their carefully considered choices, the Anthony Heck Poetry Prize is now established as one that any poet early on in his or her career is likely to take very seriously. Our judge for this, the 15th contest, is another enormously distinguished figure, Edward Hirsch. Mr. Hirsch is probably best known as a poet, having 10 well-received collections to his name. The first of these, For the Sleepwalkers, was published in 1981 and announced the arrival of a distinctive new voice, winning its author two important awards, the Lavin Younger Poets Award from the Academy of American Poets and the Delmore Schwartz Memorial Award from New York University. His most recent collection, Stranger by Night, was published by Knopf only last year and has been described by one reviewer as, and I quote, consummate, passionate, generous, and resplendent, vanquishing the static of our lives and guiding us back to a place of contemplation and gratitude. But if Mr. Hirsch is first and foremost a poet, he is many other things besides, an editor, a critic, and an essayist, with at least another 10 books to his name, the most recent being 100 Poems to Break Your Heart, an anthology which was released only last month. He was for several years a contributor to the Washington Post book world, writing an influential weekly column about poetry. He taught for six years at Wayne State University, for a further 17 years at the University of Houston, and is now visiting distinguished professor in the creative writing program at NYU. Even now, I have left out something very important from Mr. Hirsch's resume, namely his being the fourth president of that vitally important institution, the Guggenheim Foundation, a position he has held for almost 20 years. In the 30 years since Mr. Hirsch won the Lavin and the Delmore Schwartz Awards, he has received many other honors, amongst them the National Book Critics Award, a MacArthur Fellowship, an Ingram Merrill Foundation Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Pablo Neruda Presidential Medal of Honor, the Prix de Rome, and an Academy of Arts and Letters Award. In 2008, he was elected a Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, and at the latest count, he holds seven honorary degrees. 
We were delighted when Mr. Hirsch agreed to take time out from his busy schedule to judge the 15th Hecht Prize for us, and it gives me great pleasure to invite him now to introduce this year's winner. I'm very glad to be with you. It was an honor to judge this year's award for Waywiser Press. I greatly admire Anthony Hecht's work, his extraordinary skill and deep humanity, and so I was grateful when Joseph Harrison and Philip Hoy tapped me to pick a winner for the 15th Anthony Heck Poetry Prize. It felt as if I could pay something back for all the joy that I've gotten over the years from Wayweiser Books. And it's a privilege to extend the Hectian lineage in American poetry. The quality of applicants for this year's award was very high. I was immersed in skillful manuscripts by 16 highly capable semi-finalists and finalists. The names of the authors were withheld, and so I was working blind. But I nonetheless felt as if I knew something about each and every one of these writers. It made me feel hopeful about the state of American poetry. The book that I kept returning to, and finally felt that I wanted and even needed to choose, was Club Q. I did not know at the time that it was by James Davis, but I did know that someone had written a startling book. Club Q is very cleverly conceived, formally deft, and musically resourceful. It is also flamboyantly gay. I call it the queerest of queer poetry books. It keeps finding closets to shred and takes special pleasure and even glee in its literary outings and exposures, its urban scenes and outposts. As a poet, James Davis loves shimmering surfaces and linguistic games, but his virtuoso formal strategies only partly succeed in, in hiding the pain of a lonely, misunderstood childhood growing up in Colorado Springs, Colorado, dogged by malls and mega churches, shadowed by a US military base. It's a fundamentalist base too, and evangelical Christian soldiers seem to be everywhere. Davis's poems are often cleverly rhymed and brightly formal, but that doesn't entirely conceal his memories of a child's discomfort and even desperation, his desire to float free and escape the godly bubble. In this book, we can trace some of the ways that a misfit kid grows up to become a gay man looking for a way to transcend his isolation and find a community. He seeks a refuge. That's why Q becomes a club. Davis is a poet of the quest, the query, and the quotidian. The letter Q in LGBTQ stands both for gay and for questioning. And Davis uses it both ways in the title poem, which begins, I stand for quest. He is a seeker. I like the way he runs through various words beginning with the 17th letter of the alphabet, such as queen, and quarters, and then homes in. Of course, I stand for queer, which is to say unique, which is to say alone. He also picks up the words questioning and quarantine, which especially resonate with all of us now. We all know that America can be a toxic environment, especially for anyone who is different or values. And I'm moved by the way that David stands up for the vulnerable. But he is not just outraged. He also provides us with a counterweight of joie de vivre. James Davis has a fresh voice and a witty, inclusive mission. It gives me great pleasure to welcome this book into the world. I'm eager to invite you to a new democratic venue, which is now officially open, Club Q. Please welcome its proprietor, James Davis. Hello, Hammer Museum. Thank you so much for hosting me, hosting my book launch. This is so exciting. I can't believe that I'm actually having a book launch. Um, Club Q uh, is my little baby. And I'm so thankful to Ed Hirsch, Edward Hirsch, for selecting the manuscript um, for the Hecht Prize for his introduction today and for his wonderful foreword in the book. Um, his words for my poems are gonna stick with me forever. I'm gonna have that for the rest of my life. So 
thank you so much, Edward. Um, I want to thank the folks at Waywiser, especially Joe Harrison, Philip Hoy, and Eric McHenry. They've all been fantastic to work with throughout this entire process and have just made this a dream come true, very literally. Um, I want to thank the Hammer Museum again for having me. Um, it's been really wonderful to Post this virtually so I can share it with everyone and they've been just wonderful about working with me and getting all the tech stuff set up. Um, I want to thank my blurbers, my wonderful blurbers, uh, Kaki Wilkinson, Kate Marvin, and Randall Mann, all of whom are heroes of mine and just fantastic to help me celebrate the book. Uh, shout outs to the Lighthouse Writers Workshop. Um, their poetry collective helped me make this book, along with the Mastheads Writers Residency. Um, big gratitude to those organizations. And last of all, my mom, Hope. Uh, this book is dedicated to her. So mom, this is for you. All right, my book is divided in three sections. Um, I'm gonna read just a handful of poems from each of the three sections. Uh, the first section is called Quest, um, and I'm going to read the title poem, which is Club Q. I stand for quest, which is to say mission, as in our mission is to provide a safe space for you to be yourself, which is to say it is not always safe for you to be yourself. For Queen, as in a 6-4 share, hosting Wednesday night karaoke, always the first and last to sing. For quarters, which is to say jukebox, eight ball, cigarettes, home. Of course, I stand for queer, which is to say unique, which is to say alone. I am queer in a military town whose cadets count out football scores and push-ups and blue angels bar up the sky. For quarantine, for questioning, as in, how long have you known? As in, would you like to dance? As in a dance floor, empty save for two men kissing, a patio fenced in, the warmth of a fire pit, the sweetness of his saliva after three gin and tonics for quick, which is to say alive, which is to say mortal. I am quick as a number scrawled on a cocktail napkin between pages of a one-year Bible on a nightstand, quiet as the fist-sized cloud rising from the sea after Elijah slaughters his 450th prophet of Baal, for quench, to satisfy, and to extinguish. I stand for rainbow, and I stand for rain. In Houston, remembering it is like remembering the womb, the heat, the concrete, the tofu sandwiches. I was democratic there. I had directions in three languages. I was punched in a Fiesta Mart parking lot. I was rigged. I made out with hipsters, some of them straight, all of them strangers, at a 70s sportswear party. Later, one told me, you're right. My space is for fascists and faggots, of which you are both. I dabbled in Montrose and Montaigne, snorted half a line behind the dumpster behind Texas Art Supply. My French professor complimented my nasals. Saint Barthélemy, she helped me say. Sandbar, tail me. There were the minor drugs, Adderall, cowboy killers, ironic tab. I was a sanctimonious double major. I learned how things went bad. Potatoes liquefied in my pantry. During the library renovations, I snuck classmates up to the empty eighth floor and fingered their assholes. How juvenile, my quest for
for omniscience. The weekend after, we spent Independence Day in Santa Fe. The hotel was okay. We found room to be gay at restaurants over beers in Georgia O'Keeffe's early years. We found room for tears. We saw a Pixar movie, two queers sobbing in the dark. Thank God something led us. The week before, we'd learned your status and mine. It didn't get us both. We were no longer lovers in the carnal sense. We shared a queen and left no stain. The fireworks were canceled by the rain. You complained about my music, my driving, my silence. I didn't argue, my feelings absence itself a kind of violence. We took pictures in the ruins of the bandolier. We saw a stag. We ate Frito pie out of the bag. Climbing a ladder leaned against a crag. You posed, one hairy leg kicked up, fist under your beard. We found room to be weird. We idled on the shoulder till a storm cleared. The end was closer than it appeared. All right, the last section from the last poem from Quest uh, is called Arcade Scented Candle. Heaven is a chorus boy. He twirls into the splits. He does not love you. You have some sense your life is working toward him. If you are very good, you might just get him for Christmas. He is a pony with beautiful haunches. He does not love you. If he had a smell, he would smell like blueberry muffins on a Saturday morning. But he has no smell. You do. You smell like an arcade, like burnt popcorn and spilled soda, like metal and ozone and decades-old nicotine. You are windowless, yet full of light. Every beep and whistle and invitation, every invitation outfitted with a slot for tokens. You are cheap. He is bathed in sunlight, shopping bags in each hand, stomping shirtless down the hallways of the mall in purple tinted sunglasses in tight white jeans. He stomps right by you. At any moment, he may break into song, fling the bags from his hands and open his arms as if for an embrace. You will never be in that embrace. If you could hold him, you would worry him in your palm like the malachite orb on your dresser. You would peer into his holes and marvel at his glittering imperfections. But he has no holes. He will not admit you. He doesn't even know what malachite is. All right, the next section of the book is called Queries, and it's comprised entirely of poems after each a uh, two-letter word in the Scrabble Dictionary, of which there are 107. Uh, there aren't that many in the book, and uh, I'm going to read four of them to you here. So the first one's called ab, which the Scrabble Dictionary defines as an abdominal muscle. Just one. The upper left, why not? Indented there like the first cookie cut into the sheet of dough to show off in becomingly posed glossies. Picture him in profile, reclining poolside, his lower gut hidden under Ulysses, his one dense knot glistening with copper tone. Picture him in vogue, um, modeling his chum Giorgio's white silk chemise with its single cutout, you know where. Up yours, ex-lubber, up yours, ennui. He exudes core power, very specific core power. You don't know what you're missing, do you? Who doesn't? Touch his tummy right there, yes, there. Lick his little nested egg. Ignore the rest, it's none of your concern. The ho-hum chest, the wispy fur ringing the nipples, the good old penis. He didn't suffer this long for you not to touch him where it counts. 
id. My id is the assistant manager of my psychic thrift store, scowling at his guests, the kids most of all, swallowing scrabble tiles and flushing the bowls of the men's room for sport. He hates men. Their big dumb chests and their stupid faces creased with charm. He takes long, lonely smoke breaks in the throes of Halloween peak hours, horks phlegm through the chilled air, and leaves the fire door wedged open with a knockoff ug and ug to let the trails of his cools snake into the changing rooms. His heart is a rack of sweaters too dense to slide the hooks. He dreams of going on a cleanse. No more smokes, no more cold brew, the drugs he takes to sleep, to wake, to hope, everything must go. He dreams of being a nightmare, crashing through cemetery gates, cardboard gravestones crumpling beneath his authentic hooves. Is. How fondly I remember the last impeachment, how much care was taken for the children. Linda Ellerby on a special edition of Nick News, explaining what fellatio meant to a circle of fifth graders, spoke gingerly as a school nurse, a practiced kind of nurturing. I felt a proud exemption. I'd given up Nickelodeon for MTV. The stained dress, the cigar, John Goodman in drag as Linda Tripp, each minutia of the great national fufara confirmed what I already knew. I would never find the right woman. A church favorite, God always answers, but not always yes. In the waning Clinton days, the sight of any shirtless man sent me straight to my bedroom, to the sheets my mother dutifully, unquestioningly washed. And on the news, night after night, the president's latest soundbite made it seem as if is could have meant anything at all, protean as snow. I had yet to learn the third person, but I knew the present meant a pleasure so filled with dread it threatened to swallow the future. 20 years later, the closing statements of the latest impeachment hearings melt in with a late November flurry. The airplane carrying a man I love has just let go of the tarmac. There is nothing inappropriate between us. Alone with the TV, the whir of a furnace, and the dregs of the coffee he brewed, I wonder what the children I don't have will remember of their first season of scandal. What words, familiar, innocuous, have already started sprouting hairs? The last section, last poem I'm going to read from Queries is called Us. Yet we remember the curve, what we felt of grace before we learned what grace meant, before divorce ate childhood, a body in perpetual emotion. There can't be a we anymore. Only when we lived together, a family of four, game night every Friday, dice or a card deck or a blank tile on a rack. Forget who won. We all played together on Blue Formica, the tank of life bubbling above the knife drawer, one thin line dividing the golden flank right through the eye to the tail fin. Naturally, we knew they would float to the top one day. Yet we remember the figure, their dance, captivity. Right, the last section of my book is called Quotidian. It's just full of the everyday. And the first poem I'm going to read from Quotidian is called American Gothic. And it's after the painting of the same name. The farmer is in love with his work, not with you who are not his wife, but his daughter, plain as the pitchfork clutched in his hand, white as the briefs around his loins. Some poison keeps the men away. A thief stole Lindy's baby. Soon enough, Japan will plant its flag in European soil. You close your eyes and see La Marianne bare-chested on a battlefield of oiled Gallic bodies, 
tramping as if through lanes of Zia maze. Change is cruel. Not long ago, you ate your first sardine, bathed in oil, shipped from Nantucket to Des Moines. It slid pristine, head first, down your throat. You didn't like it. The taste stuck to your mouth like tallow to a frying pan. In the shallow bucket of your stomach, you felt a crow's feet gently begin to kick, a little jerk, keeping time with your heart's adagio. To the observant motorist who called me faggot, we have names for things we barely understand. The Doppler effect, for instance. You have no idea how it works, and neither do I, but I'm sure we both can appreciate the way it splits a word in two clean syllables, the fag from it, the it from fag. I like to think of myself as a hyphen. To you, maybe, I'm a pinata, gaily colored, filled with sugar, battered open by blindfolded children. Maybe in your life's game of tag, I am perpetually it. Or maybe after all, I am nothing. Something approached, named, and sublimated. I've thought of several names for you. Chuck seemed appropriate. But without a name, you are your civic. It's rattling speakers. It's red taillights forever headed south. These last two poems, I'm going to read are elegies. elegies. Uh, first one is an elegy to my grandfather who passed in 2018, and it's called Magnavox Opus. There are extinct arts, one of them being the way my grandfather built a library of movies taped off television, 1,200 cassettes worth in generic yellowing sleeves, their labels faced out, filled in his cramped hand, title, year, running time, and curated to his convenience. All three Star Wars movies on different tapes, pirated from different channels, no regard for genre, a Capra, Spielberg, Kurosawa triple feature, whatever was on that week according to the saddle-stitched, finger-blackening listings of the Sunday Post-Dispatch. Movies printed four cells wide with sparing one-line synopses. Hazing horror on sorority row. Western. Each recording punctuated by the proof of his watching the briefest glimpse of a Coke's fizzing brim before the tape cuts out and cuts back in on a preview of what was once the nightly news. Then back to Back to the Future and his catalog. The red spiral notebook he kept within arm's reach of his recliner in the wood panel basement, its graphed pages portioned out in alphabetical sections, a little space at the end of each for titles yet to air. Every entry with a number corresponding to a labeled drawer in one of a dozen cabinets no longer manufactured for a format no longer used, carted out of his split level home with the tapes still inside, leaving just the catalog with its little list of lasts. The last of the Mohicans, the last American hero, the last man on earth. All right, this last poem is also the last poem in the book. And it is an elegy to Tony Hoagland, um, who is one of my first writing teachers. And I feel very blessed that I was able to uh, learn from him. So this one's dedicated to Tony and it's called Between Home and Sexual. Summer and the gays remember, we hate clothes. Tan lines disappear. Manscaped creatures burn along the river banks where lovers make deposits and bounce. We relearn the warmth of underwater frottage, the all over kiss of stubble, the various intrusions of sand. On our news feeds, we are shown a group of frat brothers in Mississippi, not the first, posing in front of an Emmett Till memorial with AR-15s, rosy cheeks, white smiles, 
fingers on triggers two decades into our 21st and probably last century. It's my birthday. I can't help but heed the alerts and love the stream of friendship flowing down my Facebook wall, each pleasantry drifting between reports from the border camps. I know the former slowly, insidiously wears away the latter. Tony, you called it a ditch running between home and sexual, into which our hawkish legislators stumbled during the defense hearings. You undershot. It's a river we must cross to keep on living. Bodies wash up on both sides, bloaten, bloated, beaten, barely recognizable. It's easy to forget hatred never stops coming for any of us. But hatred never stops coming for any of us. Still summer, still the day I was born. And here by the river, my fellow man is naked, pale, and for the moment, safe as so many aren't. Soon we will swim back into the water and together, hopefully, make it back to shore. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, watching. Appreciate you. Thank you, James Davis. Very glad to be with everyone, virtually speaking. Um, my pleasure to read for Waywiser Press and the Hammer Museum and for your series. I'm going to be reading from a book of mine that was published at the beginning of the pandemic called Stranger by Night. This is a little four line poem that I translated from a Greek poet in the third century BCE called Nikonaitos. Traveler, I'm the grave of Baiton. If you go from Tyrone to Amphipolis, give Nicaracus this message. His only son died in a storm in early winter before sunrise. I think we've all been missing the certain ceremonies and rituals of grief. And sometimes I, I miss them even before the pandemic. My friends don't get buried. My friends don't get buried in cemeteries anymore. Their wives can't stand the sadness of funerals, the spectacle of wreaths and prayers, tear-soaked speeches delivered from the altar, all those lies and encomiums, the suffocating smell of flowers filling everything. No more undertakers in black suits, clutching handkerchiefs, old buddies weeping in corners, telling off color stories, nipping shots. No more covered mirrors, black dresses, skull caps and crucifixes. Sometimes it takes me a year or two to get out of the backyard in Sheffield or Fresno those tall ashes scattered under a tree somewhere in a park, somewhere in New Jersey. I am a delinquent mourner stepping on pine cones, forgetting to pray. But the mourning goes on anyway, because my friends keep dying without a schedule, without even a funeral, while the silence drums us from the other side. The suffocating smell of flowers fills everything, always. The darkness grows warmer, then colder. I just have to lie down on the grass and press my mouth to the earth to call them so they would answer. The Black Dress. I don't know why I opened her book almost randomly on a whim. It signaled me from the shelf after all these years like a burning black dress tangled in the branches. Her dress, she was the one who was burning. And that's when the letter fell out, a love letter, sort of, after we'd given up on each other, or did we, our impossibility. And suddenly it came back to me in a rush, that night in Boston, a restaurant on the harbor, a storm simmering outside that slinky black dress she was wearing. I didn't know she was burning inside of it. I thought it was the coming storm, summer lightning. 
I didn't know I was turning the pages of her book, her body, which I could read so closely. I wanted it so desperately. She was the fire. I didn't know she was already mourning for her childhood in the orchard, her lost self. Forgive me. I didn't know she was burning when she took off that black dress. The unveiling. Instead of a pebble to mark our grief or a coin to ease his passage, you placed a speaker at the top of his head and suddenly a drum beat came blasting out of the grass, startling the mourners on the far side of the cemetery, clanging the trees, scattering the swifts that had gathered around the stone like souls of the dead, souls that were now parting to make way for a noisy spirit rising out of the dirt. This is for a dear friend and wonderful poet named Mark Strand. It's called In Memory of Mark Strand, Crumville Cemetery, Olive Bridge, New York. I'm not sure why I glanced back at the bus driver grinding a cigarette butt with her heel into the gravel driveway. She was a figure from a myth, from one of his poems, a stranger, a guardian marking the passage to the other world. Maybe she was just another way of distracting myself from the burial, from waiting in stunned silence while the other mourners, all the forlorn gathered at the graveside without a rabbi or a priest to lead us in prayer. It could be said that we were godless, haunted, lost, as we stood in the vanishing light and light rain. Perhaps we had given up too much. The fundamental beliefs, the consoling rituals that would have made the day more bearable. But as we huddled together in the afternoon, quivering a little in the chill mist, muffling our sobs, looking up every now and then at the tall pines, we felt something lonely moving amongst us, a current almost, a small gust of wind, not a ghost exactly, nothing like that, but the ghost of a feeling, a shiver, which we might have missed altogether, except he had changed. We were changed. This is a poem called The Radiance. It's set in Detroit in 1984, my first teaching job. And um, a friend of mine named Dan Hughes makes an appearance who had MS and was a Shakespeare scholar, extraordinary person. The Radiance, Detroit, 1984. Late September in the shade outside of State Hall, that concrete brutality where my students are smoking off a hangover and gossiping in Ukrainian, while Dan Hughes leans on his walker and talks to me about Shelley's bright destructions. I did not know it was indelible, the sun spangling the campus trees, the traffic thickening the smog outside the museum on Woodward, our voices rising. When you tell the story of those years going up in flames, don't forget the radiance of that day in autumn, burning out of time. This is about my, my first teaching job when I taught in Pennsylvania poets in the schools, second grade and third grade in high school classes, all sorts. What is happiness? What is happiness anyway? Someone wondered aloud at the lingering party on the lawn. And all at once I was catapulted back into a raucous second grade classroom in Northern Pennsylvania. Everyone clamoring with memories of wading naked into the Susquehanna River, running wildly over sandstone and shales, jumping over concrete dividers, steel railings, the whole family pointing together at the peak of North Knob. I stood at the blackboard calling out names 
and noting it all down, marveling at so much jubilance, fully absorbed in our creation. Days of 1975. It started with the tattered blue secret of Basho, that windswept spirit riding my back pocket for luck. It started with a walk through the woods at dawn, mud on my new shoes, high humming in the trees. I was not prepared for the scent of freshly turned soil to pervade the empty classroom or the morning to commence with a bell that did not stop ringing in my head. So many expectations filed noisily into the room. I was ready to begin. From the tall windows, I could see a storefront church opening on the other side of the polluted river. I remember walking past the rows and rows of bent heads, scarred desks, and gazing up at the endless mountains. In those hopeful days of 1975, I drove the country roads in honor of radiance. O oh, spirit of poetry, souls of those I have loved, come back to teach me again. This is about one of my first jobs when I was working as a brakeman on the railroad. It's called, That's the Job. That's the job, he said, shrugging his shoulders and running his hand through his hair, like Dante or a spider who knows its web. That's just the job, he repeated stubbornly whenever I complained about working the night shift in 100 degree heat or hauling my ass over the hump for a foul mouth dis for a mouth foul mouth dispatcher yelling at us over a loudspeaker, or riding the cab of an iron dungeon creeping over bumpy rails to a steel mill rising out of the smog in Joliet or Calumet City, where we headed to track down a few hundred giants in chains clanking together on rusty wheels for dragging home and uncoupling at the clearing yard loaded with empty freight cars, waiting to be loaded with more freight because that's the job. A small tribe. The legend of a small tribe who crossed the steps to become Eastern European eyeglass grinders with weak eyesight, horse traders, deserters from the Russian army, peddlers, and practical merchants, Men who cried at the sad stories of women in tenements who made their mothers laugh over steaming cups of coffee at the kitchen table. Social Democrats who argued with anarchists and communists. Zionists who never traveled to Zion. Failed businessmen who snuck into Carnegie Hall to hear Rubenstein playing Chopin and then stood on a soapbox in Union Square shouting for justice in the Spanish Civil War who loved used bookstores and the musty back stacks of old libraries, but started a drugstore in Rochester or sat on his suitcase waiting for the train to misfortune, selling shirts on Maxwell Street, asthmatics, non-assimilators whose daughters married developers who never developed and scrap metal dealers looking for an honest advantage, a gambler who beat the house and lost everything three times a box salesman who could not contain himself, a scribbler. My favorite was a daydreamer who bought a new hat every year for Passover so that he could stand outside the temple, which he refused to enter, though he loved the songs and wanted to be close to the prayers. This is a kind of ode and elegy for all the poets that I shared poems with, you get to be a certain age and suddenly you realize that so many people that you had spent so much time with trading poems or have died and you're left with your memories of them. The Guild. Goodbye to the years we spent leaning over badly typed poems in cramped studies and dank hotel rooms, half crazed, inconsolable, constantly jabbing pencils at each other, 
brooding, smoking on the balcony across from a temple on the other side of the river, one night in Rome, loyal or disloyal to the old gods, our flawed mentors, our weakness for standing at the podium, seeking applause, slashing lines, reciting Blake or Yates, giving up sleep for late night sessions, listening to Coltrane and gossiping about new books and poets who've been dead for centuries, facing each other knee to knee or sitting side by side over each fresh draft, furiously arguing about this enjambment or that illusion, mysteries of the craft, the muse, our shoulders touching, our voices growing hoarse with laughter or walking out to the pier a few yards from the sea so that we could stand there together under the stars, alone with the abyss. Stranger by night. After I lost my peripheral vision, I started getting sideswiped by pedestrians cutting in front of me, almost randomly, like memories I couldn't see coming as I left the building at twilight, or stepped gingerly off the curb, or even just crossed the wet pavement to the stairs, descending precipitously into the subway station. And I apologized to every one of those strangers, jostling me in a world that had grown stranger by night. A baker swept by. You were already losing your eyesight last winter in Rome when you paused in the doorway at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning and a baker swept by on a shiny bicycle, waving a cap and singing under his breath. You didn't know bakers wore white aprons dusted with flour and floated around the city like angels on a freshly baked day. You weren't sure why morning halted up and down the street as you stood in the doorway and a baker winged by on a weekend morning so new and pristine that you looked into the sky and for one undiminished instant of misplaced time, you saw brightness, brightness everywhere before a shadow crossed the rooftops and it was blotted out. Um, I'm just going to read you two more poems. This is called, I Walked Out of the Cemetery. I put down my prayer book and sifted through a wave of fresh mourners gathering at a nearby grave. I didn't stop to ask who had died. I didn't wait for the eight pallbearers lurching toward us with a casket in their hands. I didn't even pause to wonder about a young woman lifting her veil and applying lipstick under a long limbed sycamore by the side of the road. For once, I didn't look back. The dying goes on, it never stops. There was a new procession of black sedans winding down the lane, but I didn't hesitate to step around them on my mission to leave these hallowed grounds. I felt so liberated, I couldn't help waving to a group of teenagers listening to rowdy music and drinking beer in the parking lot behind the chapel. And finally, um, thanks so much to all of you. Glad to be with you. Finally, don't write elegies. Don't write elegies anymore. Let someone else stumble past the mausoleum and grieve under the calm shade of a plane tree, wiping away the tears of his ex-wife standing the knees of his black suit, first sobbing, then choking back sobs, comforting others, consoling himself by scrubbing the white stone and weeding the plot year after year. I'm sorry, it's too sad. It's time for someone else to mourn my dead, though who else can do it? I just need to lie here a while longer, face down in the soil, and then get up and breathe. That's a great way to celebrate uh, Poetry Month, I think. Thank you so much 
uh, Ed and James and, uh, and Joe and Phil. Um, and thank you all for Zooming in. Um, don't forget that you still have uh, Shakespeare's likely birthday uh, coming up on the 23rd. And then, of course, uh, I know you won't forget Walpurgisnacht, which is on the 30th. Uh, and keep your eye out, please, for future Hammer Poetry readings. Thanks much. Bye-bye.